Is playing bullet chess good for you and does it help you improve your chess? This is what we're going to cover today. Uh, my name is Philip. I'm a 2100 FIDE rated player from New Zealand and I make these videos uh, both to entertain you but most importantly to help you improve your chess. <clears throat> so let's think about why, I'll just say it right now, bullet is not going to help you improve your chess. I know you're probably thinking I love playing bullet, I love playing speed chess. But I'll, I'll break the truth to you. It's just not going to help you get better. Um, so if you want to have a lot of fun, by all means, go ahead, play those one minute games. But if you want to get good, get great, become an international master, become a grandmaster, reach your aspirations, win a bunch of tournaments, get famous, uh, beat Magnus for the world championship. Maybe not that, but yeah, all of the other stuff, then you don't want to be playing bullet chess. <clears throat> So let's, let's have a think about why that is. In order to improve at anything, there are certain requirements that need to be met. So requirement number one is sort of like the 10,000 hour rule, right? A lot of you would have heard that <clears throat> to become a master at anything, to achieve mastery, you need to put 10,000 hours into it as a rough guideline. So if you want to become the best at playing piano or a master at playing piano, you've got to put 10,000 hours worth of time into that. Um, the improvement on the 10,000 hour rule is 10,000 hour rep uh, 10,000 repetitions of something. So that means you want to get a high number of repetitions in of whatever you are doing. So whether it's playing a piano song or so, some notes or a chess game, if you play one chess game and it takes you 10,000 hours, you're not going to improve. If you play 10,000 chess games that, that last one hour each, then you'll improve. Um, if that makes sense. The other thing you need in order to achieve improvement in anything is the ability to review each of those repetitions or as many as you can <clears throat> and then deliberately reflect and study and figure out where you made mistakes so that on the next repetition you're slightly better and slightly better. Kind of like how Alpha Zero, right? Alpha Zero plays itself a million times or 10 million times or whatever it is and it figures out how to play chess by making mistakes, right? That's called machine learning. And in a way, humans do machine learning as well with our brains, but we just do it over a period of years rather than seconds or minutes. Uh, and the other thing you need to improve at anything, um, <clears throat> this is some life advice for you younger people, um, me being in my 30s, uh, the last thing you need is a medium pressure environment. So you want to achieve what's called flow state thinking. So you, if you're doing something that's too easy, low pressure, you're just going to be bored. It's not going to push you. It's not going to get you uh, thinking about how to push and be better. So that's if it's easy, if it's too hard, it's very discouraging. It's very, uh, you, you just lose at whatever you're doing without even knowing where you made a mistake. And it, it's just it's not conducive to improvement. <clears throat> so you want that Goldilocks spot, not too easy, not too hard, right in the middle, that's where you hit flow state. In chess, how does that look like? Well, I would probably say it's when you play people 100 or 150 ELO higher or lower than you, that's your sweet spot, that's your medium pressure environment. So if you're, let's say you're 1500 ELO, you don't wanna be playing people too much less than 1350 on the low side because you're just not going to get anything out of it. If you play 1200s as a 1500, you're not going to, you're just, you're going to win, but you're not going to learn anything, <clears throat> right? So we're, we're talking about how to improve here. Um, at the same time, if you're 1500, you don't want to be playing 1800s all the time because they're just going to whip your ass nine times out of 10. And again, you're, you're not going to learn. It's going to be discouraging. It's not fun. So you want to be in that sort of 1350 to 1650 player opponent range. Um, so just quickly, you guys might be looking at the chessboard here and thinking, why does he have a dragon Sicilian position up in front of us? Uh, and he hasn't mentioned that once. Well, we're going to come back to that in a moment, <clears throat> but let's just quickly cover the concepts of improvement so that you understand why bullet doesn't help you improve. Um, and you're just wasting your time really. And then we'll get to the Sicilian in a minute because that's going to illustrate the points. <clears throat> so as we can see here, the problems with bullet chess is it's actually high repetitions. So it satisfies that first criteria, which is good, which is great. 
um, but there's no ability to review the games. When you, when you sit down and play 10, 20 bullet games in a row, you're not actually looking back on those games. So you never get the ability to review and study and learn from your mistakes. <clears throat> Last but not least, it's too fast to be able to achieve deep thinking and deep thought. Um, so it's, it's not even an easy pressure, uh, easy environment. It's not medium. It's not hard. It's just nothing. It's just too fast. It's all instinct. So you're, you're never going to reach that point where you're thinking deeply, weighing off one move to the next in order to um, figure out the nuances of, of the position and then take those nuances into your next game, into your next game. And then 100 games later, you're 100 ELO better. You know, that, that's probably not a bad way of looking at it, actually. Every, I would probably say, rough sense, every 100 classical chess games you play, you'll probably improve... Maybe two, three hundred elo. So, in fact, every every classical chess game you play, you're probably improving three elo every time, just in a non-linear way, right? You have to look at it year on year. Like, if you start the year at twelve hundred, do you finish the year at fourteen hundred, or do you finish it at twelve hundred and twenty? In which case, you haven't improved. If you finish it at fourteen hundred or fifteen hundred, you've improved. The next year, you finish at fifteen or sixteen hundred, you've improved. 17 or 18 and then you look back after five or six years and you're a 2000 rated player um, and then you've got aspirations to become a 2400 uh, international master anyway we're digressing <clears throat> so let's have a look at if we're not playing bullet what should we be doing in order to uh, help us improve as quickly as possible what's the optimal split so this is what i think as an experienced chess player, as a 2100 player, um, the best split is this. So you want to have 30% of your time. So let, let's think about it this way. Let's say you play chess 10 hours a week. So not 50 hours, not two hours, 10 hours, nice round number. It's a reasonable amount of time as well. A couple of hours per day. Um, if you're doing much less than that, good luck improving at anything. Um, <clears throat> so 30% of your time, so three out of those 10 hours roughly in an average week, should be slow study. So that's reading chess books, studying from books, reviewing grandmaster games, looking at the commentary and annotations, and really understanding the nuances of the, of the position at a slow, really deep thinking level. 20% of the time should be classical time control, which is about 90 minutes plus each. Um, and how that manifests in a week is if you have if you join a chess club and any person who's serious about chess improvement should join a physical chess club, not just online, but actually go in, meet people, play over the board, talk, uh, and just you know share ideas. <coughs> One classical game per week is a sweet spot. Across a week, across a year, you'll play about forty or fifty classical games that way. Um, not including any weekend tournaments that you play. This is just in your club. And to be fair, you'll probably play less than 40 because some of the weeks you'll have blitz tournaments uh, in your club. Some of the weeks you'll have rapid tournaments. <clears throat> but if, you, if you're averaging one classic game or two hours per week on classic time control, that actually, that's your... Sunday night football, that's your Saturday soccer game, that's your weekly tennis match, that's when you're actually taking everything you've learned through training and applying it in a competitive environment, in a time control where you can actually think and deliberate between moves. Um, after that, so you've 50% of your time is studying uh, slow study and classic time control. The next 25% of your time is a rapid time control. So that's either in person at your chess club or with your friends, just playing some 20, 30 minute each uh, type time controls or through chess.com. And then the very last thing is your fast time control. So blitz, yep, 20%. You can play a couple of hours of blitz. You actually, uh, I'm of the opinion, if you play blitz on top of all the other slower things, slower time controls, you will improve your game because blitz forces you to think quickly. But that's when we get to bullet, one to two minutes each. You're not thinking, you're playing by instinct, you're not learning. 5% of your time should be that. So over a 10-hour uh, study period of chess per week, 
five percent half an hour should be bullet that's you know on a sunday afternoon you've had a long week you just want to let, let off some steam you sit down you play 30 minutes of bullet get it out of your system and then move on with your day and just go back to studying uh chess through books and through playing slower time controls <clears throat> uh so so why is this split optimal well firstly you get a high amount of reps because you're getting you're getting your bullet you're getting your blitz you're getting your rapid in but you're also complementing that with that one long classical time control game per week on average unless you're playing a weekend tournament and you could be playing three on a saturday three on a sunday uh, which really helps you skyrocket your progress so you you definitely don't want to you definitely want to go to weekend tournaments as much as you can if they're in your area um, <clears throat> and so high reps tick ability to review right when we if we go back to this we need the ability to review our reps or have time spent uh, studying our mistakes so 75% of the time we can do that. So that's the 30 plus 20 plus 25 for rapid. Deep thinking and flow state, 75% of the time again, great. And then 25% of the time, so blitz and bullet, absolute mayhem and fun. So we can't not have fun, right? We've got to make sure that we're getting our fun in. Um, and that's where that 25% of the time comes in. But bullet itself <coughs> should be minimized. It's just not going to help you improve. And what a lot of people do is they they sit down and they play bullet one hour each day and they never they never play classic they never play uh rapid they never read books they just play bullet and then they wonder why their ratings 1300 permanently or 1400 permanently it's because you'll never improve this way you you're not learning where you're making mistakes um and so now that gets gets us back to this dragon position and one other position i'm going to show you and this is going to be a very quick thought experiment more than anything. <clears throat> if you came across this position, you're white here in a dragon Sicilian. It's pretty known, uh, pretty well known that white is going to try attack on the queen side and black's going to try attack. Sorry, white's going to attack on the king side. Black's going to attack on the queen side. Um, and it's winner comes first, right? Or who, the winner is whoever whoever's attack comes first. If you're playing bullet you don't even think you just you roll your pawns up the board um, but if you're playing classic or even rapid this is actually where the nuances of the position kick in so if you're white and it's your move you're thinking okay well h5 is the natural move but is that the best move what are my other options what why why not play rook b1 uh, sorry king b1 is, is that a better move or how about should i play g4 and then h5 after that well, how about knight d e2, which is another move. I need to protect my other knight on c3 in the case of a rook sacrifice. Or should I play bishop h4, uh, h6, and then lose instantly to rook takes d4? All of these things you need to think about and just weigh off. Because genuinely, king b1 might actually be the best move. This might be a false alarm. You're not actually getting any sort of an attack, and your king is going to be... You need to take that opportunity to move your king onto b1 but you ne you will never know that in a bullet game you might have 10 seconds in a blitz game but it's in those classical games in the slow study periods when you're reviewing grandmaster games where you can actually figure out the nuances of the, of the position let's just take a look at one sample line let's say you go h5 you might be thinking shit am i giving away a pawn um is, am I going to get? Am I going to get something in compensation? So let's say you go here. Again, you're calculating all of this in your head before you play h5. So here, um, if you're not careful, I'll just tell you what Black's best move is. Knight takes e4 because that opens up the attack onto the knight on d4 and. White can't really take this without this happening. So here, white can go queen e3. Best for black is to actually sacrifice the rook and move the knight back. And then the computer says this is an equal position. But again, who would have thought that this would be the position that you'd reach right before you play h5? 
right? So, so the question is, okay, then is G4 better, right? So you get into this loop of actually feeding, um, iterating, right? And iterating and understanding the position in a bit more nuance, and that's how you learn. So one more position before we wrap it up. Um, if you take a look at this position, again, in a bullet game, it's hard to tell if anyone's winning or if it's a draw. Equal material, equal bishops, end game, who's winning, don't know. Okay, so what do we do? Do we calculate? No, because we've got 15 seconds on our clock because it's bullet. So you just start playing random stuff and then black might play f5 at some point and then trade and then he's got a pass pawn and then maybe black wins with that pass pawn and you go away scratching your head. Shit, I thought I was, I thought I might actually be be better because I've got pressure on that a5 pawn with my bishop. But you'll never know in a bullet game. So, so that's where if you're playing a classic game, a classical time control game, that's when you can actually start thinking, okay, what should my plan be here? Am I, in, am I uh, threatening to be in a losing position if I play the wrong moves? Where are my weak points? How can I improve my position? Is his king at some point threatening to come in? Who's better if we trade bishops? Under what conditions can I trade bishops and then run my king into the position and start attacking um, his structure and making a queen? Would his king be in time? And then would his a pawn promote before my h pawn? All these things you need to calculate. And let's take it one step further, right? So you can see the, the king's moved from f3 to e4. Let's take it a few moves back. Let's imagine there were rooks on the board. Again, you have a position here in front of you where the computer says you are, um, I won't tell you actually, uh, whatever the computer says, the computer says. But if you look at this, it's really hard. Again, is it equal? Is white better? Is black better? It's really hard to tell. So if you're white, you need to think, well, is my position going to improve if I trade the rooks or should I be looking to trade the bishops? Or should I keep both pieces on and apply pressure to the h5 pawn or the f, uh, a5 pawn or f7 pawn? Again, so you need to consider the move rook e4. But in order to consider it, you need to consider what happens if black trades and you end up in this position. And again, we're back to this position. But again, if, if you're playing bullet, you'll never know from any position because you're playing by instinct and you're calculating really fast. And especially if you're like a 1500 player, 1500 rated player, you're just not thinking fast enough. You're just really playing moves. You're not thinking about anything. If you're 2,200, 300, 400, you're thinking, but even then you're making mistakes um, and you're better off slowing down. Um, and even if, even if you give this position to Magnus Carlsen, he could lose it as well. Although he's the master of endgame, so maybe not him, but any other super grandmaster can lose, win, or draw this position based on how much time they've got, based on who their opponent is. But the punchline is no one will improve their understanding of these types of positions if they play these purely in a bullet setting. So punchline is um, play bullet, but just really minimize it. Make sure you're getting your classic time control. Make sure you're uh, getting your book study in, you're studying books, you're studying Grandmaster games and playing rapid games. Uh, rapid's good because you can play one game an hour roughly. So if you hang out with a friend on a Saturday and you guys sit down and play five hours worth of chess, you guys can play five rapid games. And then let's say you, you go away, you win three games, they win two games or, or two draws and you win two and he wins one or they win one. Um, and you walk away feeling accomplished. You're like, man, I actually felt like I played well or I felt like, mm, like you can kind of see where you made your mistakes in your games. But anyway, get that mix in. Minimize bullet if you want to improve, if you're serious. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.